Um, okay, so, um, uh, so for me it's a great honor to be here and to be commenting on John Perry's um, uh, lectures. So I will be focusing on the, on the second lecture of Preference and the Elusive Self. I don't have any uh, funny or interesting anecdotes to, to tell about John Perry, so I'll move straight to the, to the comments. So here is the plan. Um, what I'd like to do uh, is uh, just briefly uh, go back and summarize some of the uh, relevant ideas, sorry for the end missing, uh, and then um, um, focus on two comments. One is going to uh, have to do with the question of what uh, the account that John Perry proposes in this lecture about uh, self-knowledge, how that account is related to what many people want to talk about when they talk about self-knowledge. Uh, so, like, what's the relationship between knowing who one is and self-knowledge in, in a different sense? And then uh, uh, challenge the idea that, um, uh, that knowing what time it is is really uh, as analogous to knowing who one is as, uh, as Perry seems to think. Okay, so um, uh, just a, a quick summary of the, the points I want to focus on. So, this move from primitive self-knowledge to representing oneself and to what uh, Perry in the lecture calls ordinary self-knowledge. Okay, so primitive self-knowledge. Uh, we had the example of Gertrude the chicken and uh, had this uh, workshop uh, taken place in Nebraska. I would have hoped that Perry would come with the chicken to uh, show us primitive self-knowledge uh, in action. So um, here we can't have a chicken and Gertrude, by the way, has been eaten, but uh, I thought it would be funny to, uh, well, to bring Iñaki the ant, so to have some demonstration of primitive self-knowledge. Um, now, that was the plan, but like the story, which was going to be sort of funny, uh, uh, turned out a bit sad because I captured this little ant and it didn't survive. <laughs> I'm very sorry about that. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I think he, I, I, I fed him too much of uh, apples to try like, to see how the, the primitive self-knowledge works. So um, let's, let's imagine that uh, Iñaki is really here, so we have a little ant. And so what's, what's the, um, one of the interesting questions about uh, 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 beliefs and, per well, about uh, perception-action relationship is that we have uh, Iñaki, he sees uh, a food, and then he uh, walks a little bit and eats the food. And so what we want to make sure is that uh, the organism who is perceiving the food is also the one who is acting, who is moving. Um, so that's, that's a primitive self-knowledge. So in, in Perry's account, um, what really explains this kind of uh, primitive self-knowledge is a very naturalistic picture um, uh, inspired partly by Dretzky, and uh, we can find it in John Perry's work on uh, situations and attitudes. So it's this idea that it's the organism itself uh, that is wired in such a way that the structure of the organism guarantees that the perceiver, the subject of the perception, is also the, uh, the end who is uh, eventually eating, eating the food. <clears throat> um, now, um, and so, so the idea of then like moving from like to other forms of self-knowledge is that that's the starting point. That's a primitive self-knowledge that we have with uh, uh, chicken and ants. So how then do we move to uh, a more sophisticated self-knowledge? So um, uh, John Perry talked a little bit about the mirror test. Um, so um, what's really like what's what's happening there? What's interesting is that we have um, so like features, well, humans and then some animals, um, what uh, the capacity that they have is that, so like chicken, like ants, like other creatures, like bacteria, so we have something that's in our organism that already by the structure of the organism guarantees that um, if we are a perceiver and that like, the, uh, the wiring will be such that the, uh, the person who ends up having a food is, um, is the same, but in addition, we also have uh, ways, other ways of gaining information about ourselves that is not this kind of primitive uh, uh, way of gaining information. Um, so what then the mirror test shows is that the way you normally gain information about other creatures 
around, you can use the same way, the other informative way, to gain, uh, represent, uh, to gain information about yourself. So you get a representational capacity where you can uh, then, uh, and, uh, and what, uh, what it does is it enables you to pull together uh, two types of information, this primitive uh, self-gained information with information uh, gained in this other person way. Okay. Now, um, so um, uh, mirror, the mirror test has been used by psychologists uh, to uh, try to test who, like, which are the creatures who have this capacity. Um, and there are some issues about the mirror test. Uh, uh, like for example, with my one day experience with Inaki, like one thing I was thinking is that it would be really difficult to test uh, ants uh, for the mirror test. Well, of course, you can't put them like a, a, a bit of paint and expect them to go with them, their hand and you know, remove it. But even with chicken, so like, there is all this question of like how long um, the, the organism has to be trained to, to sort of learn to behave with the mirror. Perhaps the chicken are just uh, more stupid stupid and they, it takes them really long and by the time they would have learned they get um, depressed and so on. Uh, but um, uh, so there are some issues about the mirror test. I think it's fair to say that if, like, if an animal doesn't seem to pass the mirror test, it doesn't necessarily show that the animal does not have other ways of gaining information about oneself, but what, it's, what is nice about the mirror test is that it illustrates this idea of having two channels of information and that's important for self-knowledge. Okay, so then uh, to briefly sum up those points uh, is that so this ordinary self-knowledge, as uh, Perry calls it, or knowledge of oneself as oneself, it arises from this capacity of pulling information gained by ways that normally are not for uh, self-knowledge to actually have information about yourself. And there are lots of advantages of this view and one of the main one is that it's a naturalistic view. Um, so um, so in, in the account, so we have this, so the first person thought is important and cognitively quite different from knowledge. Well, here is a quote it's, it's different from knowledge of the person one happens to be. Um, some people may have thought that this leads to an account where there is some kind of special notion of the self, but really the account is a very naturalistic one where we don't need this kind of um, like ontologically special Cartesian self or some kind of inexpressible first, mer first person mode of presentation as Frege might have had it or this kind of uh, very fancy entity. So it's all uh, uh, grounded into a natural explanation of uh, uh, episodes and uh, causing action and so on. Okay, so, so far about like, uh, the, 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 so some features I thought would be really uh, nice to go back to and highlight. Now the first um, comment or worry is that, uh, so the, in the title of the lectures, we have the elusive self, and there is often the uh, word self-knowledge that's mentioned, but then uh, people who are interested in self-knowledge might uh, be somewhat deceived that they might not find answers to issues that they are interested in. So the, the comment is going to be uh, how this uh, sense of ordinary self-knowledge of knowing who one is relates to um, to other types of self-knowledge. So first of all, um, why do people care about self-knowledge? So according to some, it's a prerequisite for happiness. So I put here a quote from the Upanishads, which says, it would be easier to fold up the entire sky in a small cloth than it would be to obtain true happiness without knowing the self. So self-knowledge, very important uh, for lots of people who are now probably watching us uh, through streaming, uh, joking apart. Uh, so why do we care about, so what do, what do epistemologists, uh, when you take a seminar on self-knowledge, what kind of issues are they going typically to talk about? There are going to be issues about how you know your own, um, your own mental state, your own attitudes, uh, whether issues like whether there is any privileged access to your own belief, am I the best place to know 
my own beliefs? Am I in a different position to access my own beliefs and know things about what I desire and I believe than some other person and so on? So that's what I think typic is typically talked about when people about talk about self-knowledge. And, uh, and this sort of self-knowledge is, well, important for happiness, but it's really also important for action. And I think it's arguably, uh, for humans, it's arguably as important for action as primitive self-knowledge. So let me give you an example where uh, this kind of self-knowledge uh, uh, matters for my uh, action. So Kepa asks me to write, it, to write, to write the paper with my comments and to have it finished by December 1st for a special issue of the Basque Journal of Philosophy. Um, so like, what are the possible actions? Well, I might go on and write the paper or I might not write the paper. So that's a kind of action that I might end up doing anyway. But the, the more interesting one is taking commitments. So I can commit to writing a paper, but I can also abstain from committing to writing a paper. So how, um, how uh, am I going to be motivated to take one action rather than the other? Well, typically, I'm going to, uh, uh, to think about my own beliefs and my own desires, whether writing uh, these comments into a paper is something that I desire more than uh, writing a, a paper about the mirror test or whatever you want or spending time at the beach and so on, whether I believe I can reasonably write it and so on. So anyway, just to like make the point, so um, uh, beliefs, uh, well, my knowledge about my own beliefs and desires, or at least beliefs about what I know about my beliefs and desires is very important for action. And so we would want uh, like uh, an account of uh, the notion of self that also is going to um, to explain, uh, well, to, to be a part of this larger account of motivating action. Now, um, uh, what's then the relationship between uh, self-knowledge in the sense that Perry talks about? It's so not primitive self-knowledge, but ordinary self-knowledge, namely knowing who one is, uh, self-knowledge in this other sense. Um, and I, th I think that the two seem to be well, dissociated or that there are important differences. And here are two cases where we can get one without getting the other. So remember the delusional Elwood. It's a character we uh, met in the previous lecture. So it's the guy who thinks that he is Francois Recanati. And I think there are various uh, versions one can tell the story. Maybe Elwood uh, have seen uh, Reca Fr Francois and he just has this belief that even though there are two bodies, they're really the same, uh, one and the same person, or maybe he never really was in the same room and has this other belief. Anyway, whichever way you construe it, um, it's fair to say that Elwood doesn't, he doesn't really know who he is. So he has a primitive self-knowledge. He, he can uh, eat food when you put it in front of him and so on, there is no issue. But what's, what's Elwood's problem is that he pulls a lot of misinformation uh, with his primitive self-knowledge. So all the information he gets about Francois, he uh, uses it to, uh, to, uh, to act himself and, and that's bad for him because uh, it might lead him to uh, like, uh, actions, lots of actions that won't be successful. But um, I think that Elwood's case is interesting because he might actually have an excellent self-knowledge in the sense of knowing his own beliefs, his desires, and so on. When you ask him what he believes, he believes that he wrote uh, mental files. Um, he knows that he believes that he wrote mental files and so on. So that would be a, 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 a case of someone who doesn't know what, who he is, but is, uh, has self-knowledge and even maybe good self-knowledge in this other sense, second order uh, self-knowledge. And then um, on the other hand, I think there are also lots of cases easy to come up with of creatures who, are, who know who they are in the sense of being able to pull information about themselves in normally other informative ways, but um, don't have uh, self-knowledge uh, in the sense of not having uh, 
the capacity of representing their own beliefs or even representing others' beliefs. So I think all of the the non-human, not well, they're definitely non-human animals who pass the mirror test, but probably don't uh, have uh, um, 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 meta representations like chimpanzees and dolphins and magpies. So, um, and then uh, another case that I want to bring up is that. Well, in the sense of like knowing who one is by being able to pull information about uh, oneself through other ways, I think it's also fair to say that lots of uh, like uh, non-animal devices like computers and mobile phones uh, have this kind of uh, capacity. You know, when I switch my mobile phone and uh, it synchronizes, it's because it recognizes itself as the phone that should get uh, whatever files and so on, uh, but I think that uh, most of them don't uh, have uh, self-knowledge in this sense in which uh, epistemologists uh, like to talk about. Okay, so now um, a brief comment about the elusive self and the elusive present and how far does the analogy go. So I think this is part of, it comes at the end of the, of the written uh, paper that uh, I base my comments on, so maybe John didn't talk that much about it here. But let's at least go back to, to the apparent analogy between knowing who one is and knowing what time it is. So I'm bringing here the, one of the famous examples, which is the messy shopper. I think most of you are uh, familiar with it, and if you're not, uh, reading the problem of the essential indexical is uh, is a must because it's one of the uh, the best opening paragraphs of a philosophy paper, in my view. So um, so we have uh, John who is in a supermarket and he's following a trail of sugar and he thinks that the person that this person who is making this mess with the torn uh, sugar bag uh, that they, they are making a mess that they should be pursued and stopped and so on. And then when he realizes that he is the one who has been making a mess, there is a, uh, an important change in action. Okay, so that's like what we want to capture with this idea that you suddenly, you had a belief about yourself which wasn't really uh, uh, a self-belief, if, if I may say so. In the, in, like, uh, on an analogy, you might think that uh, issues with time really work the same way. So um, uh, John Perry in, in, the, in the mentioned article has the uh, example of a department meeting that starts now. But like, going back to, the, to my example, so I, and it's a very realistic example. It happens to me all the time. I think that the paper must be submitted by a certain date. And I have this belief all along, but uh, the, the way this belief uh, um, leads me to action made co like, uh, um, differs at the point where you know the date has come and I must submit the paper now. And so um, you might think, well, there is really an analogy, and uh, Perry even writes that the solution to knowing what they, it is is parallel to the case of self-knowledge. So um, now the worry that I have uh, as to why the solution might not be as parallel as one might have wished. So what happens in, in the, in the self-knowledge case? I think what's really important there is that in that account of what happens when Perry realizes finally that he is the person he, he's been believing all along to be making a mess, or when Mark realizes that he is the guy that he sees in the mirror, this shabby pedagogue, um, so Perry's account, I think, relies on the fact that this other representation that the person has been having on all, all along, I mean, so in the recognition, what happens is that you start pulling together the two types of information, the information you get got in one way and the, the one in the other way, but the beliefs that you've had all along in this representation is caused by the same uh, person. It's caused in the case of a messy shopper by Bar Perry himself. He's the one who's been making a mess. He's the origin of his representation of a messy shopper and the belief. Um, what about my belief that I might submit the paper by December 1st of this year? Well, 
the analogy you now, if you want to make it really parallel, it won't work because it, it's not, it can't be caused by the future time. And that's, uh, I think, a point that already um, uh, uh, Darkfin uh, made. But so, like with times, at least there are two reasons why it can be caused. For one is, I think, uh, um, that times are not ontologically on the par with objects or physical events. There is, that's why uh, people are interested in philosophy of time, because there is something special about time and we can't really treat them just like ordinary objects, right? And on the other hand, even more, I mean, like, the events, the future events, uh, the future event of my submitting the paper can, for example, cause my, uh, my present belief because it's in the future and we don't have a backward causation, okay? So, um, um, so just to sort of bring the point home, so some analogy sure there is, and I think that when we speak about knowing what day it is, uh, so in a way it is to be able to connect the different ways of picking up information, so this is a quote from the written version, to know which day it is, it is to pull, is to pull the information I get that way with the information I pick up from calendars and date books about what is happening or what I'm supposed to do with my primitive, uh, it's only with my primitive self-knowledge. So, um, but I mean, there is something of a difference because things like days and dates and calendars, they are constructions, you know, well, like a, a kind of objects. Um, and about those, we may have well, let's call them today informative days of learning about dates and other informative days of learning about dates. Um, but um, one worry is that with, with the present, with time, the present time, it's not at least uh, prima facie completely clear that like what would be the other other time informative ways of getting information about the present. And I think that the, at least some of the discussion about the elusive present and McTaggart that gets mentioned in, in the lectures maybe addresses some, some of those uh, more complex uh, issues. Okay, so um, thank you.